the whole team, the production team, we're about to get started. A very good afternoon to you all and um, welcome to the Ole Consulting Monthly PM Roundtable. My name is Ade Adeyemi. I'm the founder and CEO at Ole Consulting. For those joining us for the first time, Ole Consulting is a management consulting firm who specializes in IT professional services in the areas of staffing, training, and project delivery services. Um, for this roundtable, we welcome you all for joining us. For this roundtable, to this monthly roundtable, um, our mandate for the PM roundtable is to create a unique platform for our IT professional community to share information, network, and dis discuss best practices and troubleshoot project issues. Essentially, our goal for this roundtable is to raise leaders and to present opportunities for career growth. And we certainly hope that today's roundtable will further that agenda. Uh, for today's roundtable, our topic is around the redefinition of leadership and innovation. Uh, we've got some great panelists on the call today. Uh, they will be sharing their background. They will be talking about their experience and practices when it comes to the redefinition of leadership and innovation uh, within their organization and within their uh, practice. Um, so we'll start with some introduction and then we'll get into the conversation. Uh, so without further ado, uh, we will get uh, start with some introduction. Our first panelist that we'll be introducing today is Laura Flesner. Welcome, Laura. Thanks so much, Ade. I appreciate it. So happy to be here. Um, Okay, so introduction to myself. I'm Laura Flessner. I am um, an innovation and leadership coach at a company I founded, MindTap. I founded the company in 2020. I have um, over 17 years of experience in the corporate, um, corporate, in more of the consumer goods space at Procter & Gamble and Pfizer and other companies. And uh, I decided to start my own business in 2020 to help empower what I call the hard workers, the doers um, into leadership. Uh, and particularly the folks that are, uh, I call them non-typical leaders, right? Women, minorities, introverts um, are just a few of the classifications. And uh, because I was one myself and um, having to overcome that barrier into, uh, into the space of leadership. So uh, that's what I do. I coach um, and train online with the different programs and do personal coaching along with um, other things and working with corporations. I'm so excited to be here to talk about two of my favorite things, innovation and leadership. Okay, excellent. Well, thanks so much, Laura. Uh, we're excited to have you on the call and uh, looking forward to having this uh, very, very uh, exciting conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our next panelist uh, that we'll be introducing uh, is uh, is been at the roundtable in the past, um, and we're excited to have him back, uh, Amid Aziz. Welcome, Amid. Hey, Ade. How are you? Thank Great. you. Thank you for having me today. Um, again, uh, everyone, my name is Hamid Aziz. I am coming in with a background on product and project management, and as you can see, I am very enthusiastic in regards to these key things and the discussions that we're going to have today have definitely piqued my interest and I hope it piques yours as well. Uh, leadership and innovation is something that goes, I believe, hand in hand. And uh, these, these are the types of things that gets me going through the day. So I, I again, I'm really excited to be here and really, truly I'm looking to dig deep into the conversation. Excellent. Well, I'm, I'm really excited to have you as well, Amid, and I'm really excited because uh, we have some really, really interesting uh, things that we'll be discussing today. Um, so we'll transition. Uh, I guess the conversation today is going to be around the redefinition of leadership and innovation. Uh, some of the questions we're going to be asking is, uh, what does it mean to innovate in today's uh, you know, very fast paced, ever, ever evolving uh, business community? Uh, what does it mean to innovate? What is the role of leadership when it comes to innovation? Uh, this is a very interesting conversation, but uh, we'll exit the presentation mode and uh, dive into the conversation um, and you know, get to see who's on the call. But uh, at this point, we'll get to focusing on the speakers and uh, see how we can get started with this conversation. I, and my first question here is to you, Laura. Um, how do you define 
innovation? And it was a two part question. How do you define innovation? And second part is, how do you think this diverges from the common understanding of what it means to innovate? Yeah, um, let me start with that second part first, because I think that's, you know, when you say the word innovation, a lot of times the first thing that comes to mind are like really big, cool, different, disruptive things. And a lot of times it has to do with um, new technology, right? New to the world that hasn't been seen before. Like when the iPhone first came, that was huge and really different. And now thinking about Bitcoin and online currency, like how does that even work? Like these are huge innovations. Um, but what I like to do is redefine innovation to be something that is more accessible because to me, innovation is really just about creative problem solving. It's a drive to make things better than what they are today. And honestly, I think everyone, especially driven professionals are already innovating whether they realize it or not. Mm -hmm. uh, but the thing is, once you realize that what you're doing is innovating, you are seeing a problem, you are creating solutions and new ways to go about that, to be able to bring value and impact to the world. Once you realize that that's innovation, that's what you're doing, then you actually have access to a plethora of innovation tools, innovation mindsets and processes that innovators use and have been proven to increase probability of success around new ideas because it's it's not easy to bring new things to life, right? I see him mean, right? I'm shaking his head, that's so true. And so these tools and processes um, really can help fuel you, propel you once you realize you have access to these, not just those innovation groups over there or that innovative company over there, you are an innovator. And so now you can take hold of that. You can drive innovation right from where you are, right in your role today and make a difference and make change. Interesting. Well, thanks so much, Laura. That, that's a lot. Uh, and, and something that's not, that, that, that I'm taking away from that is around the creative problem solving uh, that we, capability that we all have. And maybe I make, I, mean, I you know, how do people get to recognize, uh, maybe a follow-up question with that. Uh, how do people start to recognize that they have that innate ability to innovate? Because obviously, we are solving problems in different capacity in different positions that we're operating at. Uh, but I think one thing that you mentioned is having that innovative mindset. How do people start recognizing that? That innovative mindset. It's amazing because, um, because it is a different mindset, uh, actually in how the brain works, it activates different neural pathways. It's a different way that your brain works versus analytical thinking. So, you know, if we think about um, data driven um, decisions and a lot of the, you know, data is king a lot of times in business, right? Because it drives decisions. It really gives confidence behind decisions. The thing about innovation though, is that data doesn't tell us everything. It doesn't tell us what to do with that information. It doesn't tell us what then should we go and create to solve? Um, and so then you have to shift from analytical thinking to literally creating. And I think we think about creativity as something that those musicians do or those artists do. It's not something that I do as a um, hardcore professional, right? But creativity is literally about building a new future, um, the next thing that you're going to solve. And if you reframe yourself into create, that's what creativity is, then you can use it and switch to a question that fuels me to switch into that mindset. Because I think, you know, talking about switching neural pathways from analytical to creative is starting with the question, what if? What if this were the case? 
just suppose we tried this thing that could be crazy as an idea, but just suppose for a moment, suspend reality and think what then? And that opens up the mind to start to create, to start to build. Hmm. Well, uh, there's a lot to unpack there, uh, Laura. Thank you so much. This is exciting. I'm really excited. Uh, just want a few housekeeping. Um, if you are, we want to encourage the uh, participants to uh, be part of the conversation. So please share your questions through the chat. Um, if you, uh, and again, if you're not speaking, uh, please put your mic on mute. Um, again, we'll, we'll get into this conversation. We'll talk about uh, how we switch from analytical thinking to creative thinking and how can we be creative to build solutions for the future. And my question is gonna go next to Amid. Amid, uh, understanding that you are someone that leads product management, product uh, developments within your organization. Mm -hmm. How do you encourage innovation in your organization? And how do we begin to make innovation a priority within an organizational context? Well, that's a, that's a great question, um, Adi. And I think Laura kind of touched upon it at, at the beginning when she answered, like, what is innovation? Because in order to encourage innovation, you need to understand what it is. And the example that she gave was exactly what I was thinking about. And when, when you hear innovation, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Apple with the iPhone. Like that's right off the bat. That's And I was like, oh my God, that's the same minds. Uh, because really and truly, we need to think about innovation is not just the products that come into market, right? It's, it's more so innovation is about executing on an idea, whether it's a product process or even just having a conversation. And the reason why I'm saying this is because this is the mentality that I try to get my team to get rally behind whenever we're solving problems together, right? It's, it's all about that mindset. Uh, when you make innovation a priority, it's also in the, the fundamentals of product and project management. Because like Laura said, you know, you think about the what if, but then you also kind of go around down the path of what is the problem you're trying to solve? Is it for the client? Is it for yourself? Is it a process that you want to make more efficient? So you always ask why, right? Why are we even doing this? What, what problem is it truly we're solving for the organization or what problem are we trying to solve for the consumer? And then if you start doing this, you automatically make innovation a priority uh, because you aren't just solving for what's the problem right now, but you start thinking about, okay, are we solving for what are are we solving for the the future? Are we are we being more forward thinking? And that's that's truly what I believe innovation is about, and how you get that as a priority. Interesting. Thanks so much, Mate. And, and I just want to ping back what you said around the fundamental of product and project management, and you're thinking about the future in mm -hmm. terms of how things are being done. Now, can you speak to your experience? I know in product management, um, you know these days. Uh, and we're talking product and project management, there's a new approach uh, within an agile framework. Can you speak to the concept of working in, a, in an agile framework or environment and how yeah. that promotes innovation? Of course. So, you know, the, the nice thing about working in an agile environment is literally you're, you're not just reliant on your own brain to solve the problem. You're actually working as a team where whether you have business analysts, you know, you have engineers or you have testers or just just the overall lead who has the strategic vision on what needs to be done but you all kind of come together to solve the problem it's not okay Lara you're the lead tell me what to do it's actually okay Lara you're the lead let's let's figure it out we'll go to a whiteboard and draw out a mind map of okay this is where we are and this is where we need to get to and it's never a straight line when it comes to agile you kind of do those little increments of work that will provide value back to the clients in a quicker time. And then you're also looking at, okay, what else is there? It's not just plan all everything up front and then solve it later on. It's more so, okay, we're going to take a little baby step, get feedback from our clients, understand, okay, are we solving their problem or are we actually off the mark, right? And that's also, to Laura's point, it's innovation, it's creative, it's thinking outside the box and not just solving for the here and now, but trying to solve the bigger picture. 
Oh, super. Thanks so much, Amit. And again, when we were talking about innovation and how that relates to uh, the new framework of Agile, I guess maybe it's no longer new, uh, the, I guess, the future uh, of uh, project management and product management. Now, my next question to you, Laura, um, we're going to talk, we talked about Agile being a more uh, innovative um, environment and uh, smaller increments and how things are more dynamic in that space. Um, should we be thinking about innovation differently depending on uh, if someone is in a traditional leadership role or not? That's a great question. Um, whether you're in a traditional leadership role, as in you're a leader of a team or you're a leader of an organization and you have people under you or you have people looking up to you to say, you know, what's the direction? Uh, my, my answer to the question of, of should we think about innovation differently is no. Uh, that's, and, th and that aligns with the fact that innovation is accessible to anyone, right? It doesn't matter your level. Uh, what the difference is of innovation between uh, maybe uh, what I'll call a doer versus a, a lead um, is, is maybe the, the size of the innovation or the type of innovation. The types of problems that you're facing is going to be a little bit different depending where you sit. But how you think about innovation is exactly the same. And I love what Hamid said is that innovation is more than just a new product. An innovation could be a new process. An innovation could be literally a shift in culture and how you think about things as a team. Um, innovation is is actually just a new way or a new thing. And so as you think about innovation, um, when you are a leader, you are helping to guide people towards the same space of innovation, but each individual person on that team leads their own space and they need to lead how they execute their their requirements, right? Their, their responsibilities. And they can be very innovative on how they go about their responsibilities. And so as far as how do you approach innovation, it doesn't matter what role you're in. You approach um, innovation as literally just how do I solve this problem? And how do I solve this problem? Not in a way that's always been done. Take that into consideration. It's great foundation. And is there something even better that could be done that no one has done yet before? Yeah, thanks so much, Laura. Um, I'm, my next question here uh, for you is uh, Amid, uh, is close to Amid here. Yeah. And we've talked about innovation and we talked about the value of innovation and creating the space within organizations to promote innovation. Um, let's talk about some of the barriers. Um, what are some of the barriers uh, when it comes to innovation and how do we uh, mitigate them? Yeah, oh, I think. I think that's a loaded question. Uh, there's a lot of barriers when, when you think about innovation, right? And, uh, you know, just kind of thinking off the top of my head, I can probably think of three key things that are the biggest blockers uh, when, when you're trying to innovate. One for me would be having too many ideas all at once. Uh, the, reason why, uh, the reason why I'm saying this is because usually when you have so many ideas, you don't know how to focus and drive that one idea home you know it causes a lot of distraction because you get excited about one thing and then you get excited about another thing and then you're trying to do a little bit of everything and then nothing is important right you know you know what i mean so i think having too many ideas is good to be in your product backlog but then when you're trying to deliver on it you kind of focus in and zero in on okay this is the strategic goal that we want to achieve bring it bring it home right and i think the the next thing to that is is timing right i, I think timing is another big barrier when it comes to innovation because if you want to get into market quickly uh, you know looking at it from a product standpoint the clients or users want your want your product yesterday it, it's always a it's a it's always the the case whenever we're trying to deliver something fun and exciting into the market um and you know it's 
as leaders or even as team members, you kind of need to do take a take a deep breath or even take a step back and realize, are we actually planning the right steps to get this into the right hands when we're delivering, whether it's a product or process or even a communication out to your team members? Uh, sometimes we don't take the time to actually plan things out because you know some of the mindsets that happen when you go down this path of agility is okay get it done get it done quickly 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 and and get that out to market but then you also forget that there's a lot of planning involved right and planning is really really critical when it comes to delivering the right thing to the in the right time so uh that's two things i talked about um one more thing let me think really quickly uh i would have to say uh, I would have to say short term, uh, short term thinking, not long term strategy. Again, this kind of tie, all of them kind of tie into one another. Um, really, when you know when you're facing a problem, you're always trying to put a band aid solution in just so that your clients don't feel it uh, at that point in time. Sometimes that works out, but for most of the time, it's not aligned to your long term strategic objectives because. The client's kicking and screaming right now. So you try to put a bandaid on it, let them be happy. But then, you know, that racks up on the technical debt side if we go down the development side of things. And then it also goes down to the, the burn rate within your internal teams if you try to kick things out really quickly because they're the ones that are going to be doing all the heavy lifting over the next 24, 48 hours. And they feel that burn long-term. Right. So I think short-term thinking, uh, not enough time planning, and then just having too many ideas are, are key barriers when it comes to innovation. Well, interesting. Um, <clears throat> we're getting a little technical here, Amid. Um, uh, and I think, you know what, I'm guilty uh, when it comes to too many ideas because um, when our product team, um, we're talking about any new product and I come in as a product owner and I come in so many ideas. And then today I come in with a new idea. Next next day I have uh, new ideas that we're trying to, we're uh, making changes to the product. Now. We have a lot of PMs and BAs and uh, IT professionals on the call. I'm just going to stay with you here. I mean, what advice would you have for them, uh, for folks that are working with business uh, owners and business stakeholders that, you know, often make changes, even though we say, well, it's an agile environment and we are, we're open to change. But then how do you, when do you, you know, shut it down and say, we need to close out on this scope and then we need to deliver? How do you go about that? I, well, I face that on a regular basis. So, uh, so really, well, the best thing to do is always fall back on your, your overall product strategy and vision. Like, you know, what at the beginning of the year or at the end of the previous year, you kind of talk as an organization about what do you really want to achieve in the upcoming year? Now, you know, you either have these big rocks that you monumental things that you want to accomplish and have goals and aspirations to in the upcoming year. And use that as your your guide your north star whenever you're making a decision right now if you're in the the product industry where you're a software for service um you know a lot of your clients come up with oh my god this is a pain point we need to solve this now it's okay as leaders and as you know as team members to actually push back and say i get that this is a pain point but here's the things that we are working towards to get things better for you it's it's really important that as a team, you understand what that vision is and what the strategy is, because sometimes it gets blurred when you're in the thick of things. You kind of forget about what was the overall goal at the beginning of the year, because you're you're so entrenched in, OK, let's solve this client's pain point. Let's let's get this problem solved. Let's let's do what we need to do to get that you know client happy. But then sometimes you forget, like, what are we doing for ourselves to make ourselves happy? Because that's also very important. Super. Thank you so much, uh, Amit. And we do have a question in the chat uh, by uh, Kay. Thanks for the question. And the question is, and I'll put it to you both, um, uh, what are some key questions or statements that have been successful to uh, expand the allyship uh, to you know, implement innovation. So I guess this is more so around getting allyship for your innovative ideas, getting uh, buy-in. Uh, I'm not sure, Laura, if you want to take a crack at that. I'd love to take a crack at that. And um, actually, it was one of the things I was going to I was going to ask to add. Ade is a barrier that I see all the time. Is you need you need other people's help to 
roll out your innovation mm -hmm. and often outside of your immediate team right? You need those external partners, whether it's an external group within the same company, whether it's literally another company or partner. And how do you enroll these people into your innovation when it's something that's so brand new? And they're happy doing things the way that they were doing before. And oftentimes it's shifting how they have to do things in order to help you, which takes a lot more time. It takes energy. So those are things that you're taking from them and asking them to help you. Um, so how do you do this? Um, one of the things that I think innovators uh, don't often um, learn is the strength of storytelling of being able to really enroll others in your vision and understand what it is you're really trying to achieve, not on just the technical level, but beyond of what is the impact that's going to happen based off of this innovation that you're creating. And if you are able to um, understand the other person, understand their perspective, their motivations, what's important to them, how can you link what's important to them to the project that you're trying to deliver and understand how their motivations um, actually understand how in helping you can actually help them in what's important to them. So for instance, if trying to um, uh, drive um, a certain, um, lead, you know, for them, or their responsibility could be driving more um, business. And so you really bring in the aspect of how you're in helping this innovation, it will help them to drive their business. Um, and being able to be a great case study, for example, of how your leadership really impacts and being part of this program. So it's how do you put the other person into this vision and help them see what their part is in this vision, so that it's not just up to them to see how they fit in. You help them to fit into this. And in, by doing that, literally painting this picture helps to enroll them into, uh, into this partnership, into being able to implement this innovation together. Hmm. Super, thanks, Laura. And I love the fact that you use the word partnership because it is a partnership. And I think one thing that I, um, when we talk to our PM and BA community, um, when we do my coaching and mentorship, one of the biggest challenges you find within a project environment is um, you'll find that you don't have, your stakeholders are not bought into your vision. And one of the things I, I will talk to our PMs, and when you land on a project, make sure to engage everybody, understand first, let them know how your project is aligned with their own goals because often what you find is your stakeholders don't show up in your meetings. They don't show up, they don't, they're not supporting your project because it's not well communicated. So how do we let people know and we find that uh, alignment, alignment is key. Um, and thanks so much, Laura. I'm, I'm gonna ask if Amid, if you wanna respond to that question or if we can, if you like to pass. I, I think Laura covered it all perfectly, uh, literally. I, I was thinking the same along the same lines when it comes to putting, getting the team to actually putting them in the other person's shoes so that they see that vision and really understand the why, right? Because that's a key thing. Again, I, I can't stress that. If you understand the why, you can, the possibilities are endless uh, when you understand what the problem you're trying to solve and then asking the right questions. I think that is a key driver for yeah. anything. Okay, super. Well, we do have another question in the chat, and I feel like uh, the questions are coming in. Please keep them coming. Um, and the question is, how do you innovate in an ecosystem where regulatory demands and standardization restricts change? Hmm, that's a pretty loaded one. Maybe that's a question for the Canadian government. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, how do you, I'm not sure who wants to take this one. Uh, this is an interesting one. Uh, Laura, okay. Yeah, Laura. Me, please. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I worked in pharma, a very regulated industry, and um, so one aspects are um, regulations. There can be innovation in how you interpret regulations. So if you have 
you really want to get a regulatory person who has a very innovative mindset is a huge aspect in partnership here. Beyond that, I want to also um, break a myth that actually limitations spur innovation. Limitations actually spur innovation because it forces you to think more critically. It forces you to go beyond the easy answers. And innovation comes when you have connection of two different thoughts that don't normally go together. And so it forces you to break out of what you normally think of and try to think about other things that wouldn't normally go together. And there's a, there's a wonderful book called A Beautiful Constraint that talks about just this very thing and literally um, helps us understand how constraints actually help innovation to flourish. Oh, super. Well, this is very interesting, very exciting conversation. And I see there's, there are more questions coming. I uh, will keep the question. Please keep the questions coming. Uh, we're going to move on here. We've been talking innovation. What is the role of leadership? you know, when it comes to innovation. And my question to you, my next question is to you, I mean, uh, as a leader within your organization, within your product team, uh, what is the importance of diversity and inclusion when it comes to innovation? Yeah, that's definitely important. Uh, I'm a firm believer in that everyone has a different thought process when it comes to understanding, um, when it comes to problem solving. As a leader, it's important that we recognize that that really early um, and it becomes and as a leader you become more empathetic towards our team members to truly listen to what they have to say it's it's really key that you show that side of you when it comes to your team speaking up and getting them to speak up because again everyone has different mindsets when it comes to solving a problem and when when you get that feeling and when your team members start seeing that you as a leader care about what they have to say, it unlocks the potential of the whole team. Really, I've seen it over and over again, where your team members that were introverts or very shy to speak out and they listen to, they, they see you actually listening into when they speak up. You know, they may just say a one-liner about an idea that they have, but if you take that interest and really truly ask questions or from, you know, kind of get them to keep going, it gets them going. And it's, it's phenomenal. And I've seen it in multiple teams before, uh, leading on the product side, the project side, and just, just helping people understand. It's really important. I, I think being empathetic as a leader and listening in really drives that innovation. And it, it gets them excited. Like I get excited when, when I start seeing team members that don't usually speak out, speak out, it's like, all right, we got some, we got some motivation here and let's, let's keep that ball rolling. And, and you really see it. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, and I think this is a very interesting one because when, you know, I think most leaders, uh, most team leaders, often that's your biggest challenge in terms of yeah. how do we cultivate an environment where everybody feels comfortable speaking up. And I feel like I have my idea I can share my idea. And I think a lot of people, and especially minority people groups, they find themselves in meetings where they have ideas, but they're not speaking. How do you cultivate that environment? Or how do you change that mindset? I'm not sure if you both want to take on this one. How do you change that mindset of people speaking up? Uh, I, have a, uh, I have this nice, brilliant idea. Um, I'm not beating myself after the meeting that I can speak up. Yeah. Uh, we actually came across that a couple of times in I would say in the last six months where, where team members kind of were, I wouldn't say, yeah, actually they were shy to, to speak out. And again, like you said, the minorities, right? Like they, they feel, you know, in their mindset and where they're coming from, it's more command and control. Like as the leader, you tell me what to do. And then that's what I'm going to do. Put my head down and get grinded up. But what the way we change that is again, as leaders, we, when you look at the empathetical side of things, right? Like, you put yourselves in their shoes. Like, you know, it gives you their mindset and it helps you grow as a person. Uh, if you don't understand something, it's okay to ask like, hey, how's it going? Or, or why? And I'm, I'm a big advocate for asking the question why at the beginning of a lot of things. And that really truly hones in on 
building new culture and giving them a kind of a safe space of, all right, my, my boss is actually okay with me saying something and it's okay to have constructive, um, constructive conversations. Whereas, whereas uh, you know, instead of calling them arguments, it's more constructive because, you know, you want to be down, going down that path of, all right, maybe they're thinking about something that I didn't think about. And I don't have all the answers all the time. So it's good to have these kind of conversations. And that's how you kind of shift that mindset is put yourself in their shoes uh, as a leader and as, as a person, right? Because sometimes you don't know uh, what they've been through in, in their previous careers or uh, jobs that they've had. And they may not have had a, a leader that would actually listen to them, right? So it's really, really important. Can I add to that? Yeah, please. Um, I, I, that is, that's huge. I mean, what you just said, and um, and a way to maybe give practical example of how people can do that is, you know, if you're in a meeting, you notice someone not speaking or hasn't spoken in the last couple meetings. If you reach out to them outside of the meeting and say, hey, I just noticed you, you, you know, haven't been that involved. I'm just curious, what are you thinking? You know, what are your thoughts on what's going on? And often one-on-one is a safer, less demanding space, right? To be able to open up. And then in meetings, you can say, well, well, hey, you know, I talked to Hamid outside this meeting. He had this really great idea. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I really think that everyone should hear it. Hamid, can you share that with everybody? And, and literally help ease them into the meeting. And you don't have to be the leader of the meeting to be able to do this. Mm -hmm. You can do this as a team member, as as just being a part of a group and just being able to to notice and turning on that empathy empathy card um, and seeing what's going on with other people. Awesome. Well, and I do agree with both of your comments. those one-on-ones, like you said, Laura, those one-on-ones are very key. Um, and as leaders, and I think that a lot of leaders on this call, I think it's important to have those one-on-ones because you don't know the impact that uh, that person you have on that person's overall uh, landscape of what they're capable of doing. Um, and I think also uh, being advocates of uh, you know the concept of allyship. There's often people that can speak for you, that can help you uh, be solid where you're weak. Um, I think this is a very interesting conversation. We're going to keep going. Um, my, I'm just going to stay with you, Laura. Um, and, and we're going to this conversation around leadership. And similar to how you, you've redefined innovation in the way that uh, emphasizes empowerment and the ability to influence regardless of your, your role or title, uh, can you talk about how you define leadership and why such framing uh, matters? Yes. So usually when you say the word leader, you think of somebody who is high in the organization, has a powerful title, and um, has direct reports so, and a bunch of them. Uh, and what I'd like to say is that um, my definition of leadership is different. It's the ability to move people to do amazing things. And you don't need a title to be able to do that. You just need to be able to connect with people. It's, uh, it's the strength of emotional intelligence and being able to draw people in and being able to uh, connect and transfer a vision uh, the, the candle that you're burning of your idea or the place that you think that we should all go and being able to light that other person's candle so that it burns within them now in addition. So you're s- spreading that idea. You're spreading that energy. And so being able to act as a leader in this definition means that you can do this today, right from where you are. Um, And I can do it too, no matter what I'm doing. And in being able to do that, you can help to shift how people are acting or what they're doing or where their focus is. And in being able to do that in meetings or one-on-one or however you go about doing it, it helps to create action and 
and that it helps to create impact. The thing that's important is I think that there are not a shortage of ideas. There's a ton of ideas out there, but not everyone takes ownership of those ideas. So then they actually don't happen. They kind of fall flat. You know, you hear people saying, you know, why doesn't leadership do this? Why is leadership doing that? They should really do this instead. Um, and that's an idea. That's an idea right in there in itself, but you are putting the ownership on somebody else when in fact you have the power to actually shift people in a different way, even from right where you are, because it's about connection. It's not about power influence. All right, let's unpack that, Laura. You know, I think, you know, we rise by lifting others. And, and I think what you talked about when you said being able to light uh, that other person's candle, I think that's very powerful. Um, you know, when you think about it within a context of what does it mean to be a leader in today's world? It's not about the title, it's about your impact on people. And, and I think um, everybody, regardless of your position, your title, has a capacity to be a leader. And I think uh, and it, when it even talk, comes to innovating and pushing forward specific initiatives, um, taking ownership, I think it starts by taking ownership. What is my role? And we start asking questions about what, what is, you know, what can I do? How can I help? Uh, I think that that's, you know, that's the beginning. Thank you so much, Laura. Uh, I guess we'll, we'll, we'll take another question from, uh, from the audience. Uh, we have this question uh, by Dotun. Um, and the question is, can you speak to the value and cost of innovation and how they fit into your entire organizational uh, systems logic? So the value and cost of innovation and how they fit into your entire organizational systems logic. I can, I can do that, Laura. Go for it. All right. So really, uh, you know, when you, when you think about the value and cost of things when, when you're innovating, it all comes down to how much time and resources are you spending on trying to solve a problem? That's really, really important. Uh, if you kind of set boundaries in regards to, okay, we're going to try and resolve a, a problem within, you know, the first quarter or two quarters, or even if it's within like, you know, two weeks, that automatically kind of sets your tone to, all right, this is the, the cost versus the time spent, right? And that kind of could be your baseline towards how you want to track that information throughout the year. Uh, when it comes to fitting it into your organizational systems logic, it all depends, to be honest. If you're, if you're going to be in an organization that's going to be product-centric or if you're going to be customer-centric, it all, it all depends on that. If, you're, if your focus is retaining that ARR or actually being defensive for the year, then what do you do to make your clients happy and getting making sure that they they renew on their annual basis? Or if you're going to be offensive and look at innovating on, on the platform itself, are you going to be spending you know, the first six months on thinking about what's new and upcoming, doing the market research, customer feedback surveys, and then building that out later on in the year? It all depends. And that's that's what I would definitely be able to say is the best way to approach it. Super. Um, Laura, do you want to respond? The only thing I have to add, I think I made approach that great, is that just to remember that innovation drives growth. So there's a lot of fear around going after innovation because it's risky. It's uncertain. Mm -hmm. You don't know if that's actually going to work if you actually go after something. But without trying it, your business is not going to grow you're just going to be stagnant and uh, everyone else that's innovating is going to go right past you. Mm -hmm. uh, so in that sense, there's a lot of uh, cost mitigation and, you know, uh, strategic thinking that has to go around the value and cost and in those aspects, but be careful how fear plays into your decisions here. Mm -hmm. So just to be more aware of that piece of it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laura. Um, I guess we're gonna, I'm going to stay with you, uh, Amid. Amid, in terms of innovation, we talked about building support for innovation. Um, how do you scale 
your innovative ideas? I know this is kind of similar to the uh, question. How do you scale that innovative idea? You make it repeatable. Uh, no, uh, really and truly, uh, whenever we're talking about scaling, scaling processes or, you know, innovation, again, is all about bringing an idea come to light, like bringing it to light, right? Uh, and if you have an idea, how do you innovate on it and really have that conversation and build something out there? If you want to make it scalable, you know, it's really important that you make it repeatable. Um, and it's the reason why I'm saying that is, you know, there's no one one size fits all when it comes to solving a problem. You know, there's there's there is a process that you can follow to solve a problem, but that process does not necessarily mean that it works to solve all problems in your organization. So, no, no, no. Sorry. And uh, <laughs> and and really, that's that's the key thing there. Whenever we're talking about scaling anything. It's making sure that it's repeatable, understandable by anyone in your organization. Uh, if you know someone new joins your team, do you have documentation that kind of shows them the ropes? Or do you have someone that's a, a subject matter expert that can walk them through your process, right? And if you don't, that's a gap that you need to address right up front. And, and that's really what I would say if we're talking about scaling innovation would be kind of the, the key components, one of the key components that we would need to do. Interesting. And, and, and I like the fact that you mentioned uh, you're tying that to your organizational processes. And when you look at innovation from, a, from that standpoint, can you maybe speak to, I think one thing that we've done recently is have this group called the Center of Excellence Group, where we meet once a week, 30 minutes, we just have different ideas that that's kind of like a, um, an idea generation uh, group that we uh, meet on a weekly basis. Can you speak to the importance of having uh, that inbuilt into your processes? Yeah, for sure. Because if you don't have that, you never have that starting point, right? And it's important that you, you know where to fall back on whenever you're kicking off something. The, and having that kind of that idea, idea group meeting uh, once a week is phenomenal because that's where the direction comes from, right? And really, if you don't have that, it's kind of, uh, I said it at the beginning, uh, I think it was part of the barriers question for innovation. If you have too many ideas and no focus, it kind of, it really doesn't give the team the, the confidence in delivery, right? So if you have this group setting where everyone kind of aligns with, okay, this is a great idea, maybe we should follow through on it it's kind of guiding, you know, guiding the team in regards to one direction. Okay. Super, thank you so much. Can I mean- we add in on scale? Yeah, yeah, by all means, Laura. <laughs> awesome. Uh, so when I think about scale, that the things to do for scale means that um, for Hamid, what Hamid talked about, that it's repeatable. To help being repeatable, it's simple. So you've, it's, you've gotten past the part where you've proven it works, but then you've gone even farther to simplify the process and clarify why things work. And so that way you clarify the story, the understanding, the message that you have in being able to spread that to the rest of the organization or other partners. And you simplify the process that they have to go through to repeat it and scale it as well. And so by doing those things, you make it easier for people to come on board with you. Okay, super. Well, thank you so much, uh, Laura. I believe we do have another question from the uh, participants, uh, and this one is from Andrew Stennett. Thanks for joining, Andrew. Uh, how do these principles apply or differ when leading and innovating within uh, a not-for-profit or charitable organization, uh, i.e. working with volunteers um, uh, in with limited budget, et cetera, et cetera, uh, this is a very interesting one because when you innovate, and I am I, I'm part of a I'm a member of a not for profit organization as well, and I do serve in that uh, community in the community. How how do you how do these principles apply or differ when leading and innovating within a not for profit organization when you may have limited resources? 
Um, I'm happy to take that. Yeah, um, I, uh, I also do a lot of nonprofit and actually I'm really, um, uh, I'm really active in my own church and I lead a uh, mission and outreach there. And, um, I use the same practices there completely, right? The same aspect of ownership and leadership and being able to bring people along, um, especially because they're volunteers. You don't have any power influence there anymore, right? In these organizations, you want to, you want to leverage that influential power, that connection power with people um, to excite them. And the power of excitement and motivation, um, really stirring their emotions is so powerful. And so um, it's the same thing, but probably even more so is needed in this situation. But as you think about innovation, innovation is so needed in these organizations because, because of the limitations of budget and resources that they have um, that aren't the same in, as in a lot of businesses. And because of those limitations, it actually fuels even more innovation, even more creativity. Because as I said before, limitation spurs creativity. So you need to actually amplify that creative problem solving even more within these situations. So I love that you asked that question. And actually, I think um, practice practicing both the leadership and innovation in these environments makes you that much stronger in both of these things because you really have to flex those skills. Yeah, and I really agree with you, Laura. Uh, do you want to chime in on Amit? Yeah, definitely. And the, the one thing I would have said that is, you know, when you're working for uh, for a not-for-profit organization, you the people that are there, especially the volunteers, are all there for the same goal. You know, it's not that they're just, you know, doing it for, you know, for the sake of things. They're actually, everyone's in the same mindset that they're volunteering because they want to accomplish a goal for the organization, right? And I believe it's actually easier when it comes to the teams like that because you're already in that mindset, right? Everyone that's coming in is going to be able to adapt, innovate, be creative, and really solve a problem as a team. Whereas when you're, you know, when you're working in an or in a corporate office or in another organization, you kind of have the different mindsets of, yeah, I'm just here. It's a nine to five. Like, you know, I just want to you know, do what I need to do, keep my head down, get out the door. Whereas when you're volunteering and you're in a not-for-profit organization, you're actually excited. You're, you're enthusiastic. You're, you're there because you want to accomplish a goal. And it's more so that being the driver and helping on the innovation side. Okay, super. Well, I'm, I'm just going to chime in here quickly and I'm going to take the opposite uh, of what you guys just shared. Uh, while still agreeing. <laughs> with, <laughs> um, I love diverse thought here. Yeah. Um, so I, I, uh, I'm going to speak from experience. I'm part of a not-for-profit organization. And I think uh, sometimes, um, often, um, people think uh, there's a limitation to innovate because we have limited resources. Mm. Uh, but I think to the point that you raised, Laura, around... Uh, finding, I think, and, and I think even yourself, Admit, I think if you're part of an organization and there's a common goal or uh, change that you're trying to uh, influence, I think that should be one motivation. But I think one thing I also advise people that work within not-for-profit space is to use your lack of resources to come up with creative ways to uh, get things done. Um, and in, in addition to that, also having, uh, you know, having that mindset that we can get things done, but maybe it's this big, but let's come up with an agile approach where there's an incremental growth. Uh, because often when, what you find is there's a huge amount of work that we want to get done, uh, but then because we don't have the resources, let's not even bother. Mm -hmm. so why can we, how can we change mindset and start looking at small increments as means to um, innovate. And, and you know, again, uh, with those small increments, eventually uh, we get to uh, come up with something creative 
that can solve some of those problems. Uh, thank you so much for the question. Uh, um andrew uh we're gonna keep coming we want we want please keep the questions coming uh we're gonna we're gonna switch gears here. Ade, sorry just real quick i just have one more thing to add to what you just said it just spurred something okay um the the little increments as is huge as far as being able to try one thing right and just from what try one different thing but one of the things that uh, a tool that helps me our question is how else it's like, okay, normally in this situation, we would purchase this thing that would help us. We don't have the money to do that. How else can we achieve this goal? And that, that helps to open up the mindset to that creativity resourcefulness that you were talking about. So I just wanted to add that. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Laura. And I think that's very interesting because when you start asking those sort of questions, then the solution might be staring in front of you. Um, so let's move on to the next uh, piece of the agenda. This is a spotlight uh, for Laura. We want to thank you, Laura, for joining us today. Uh, Laura, um, you have some in interesting information you'd like to share with our audience today. Um, Laura, Laura, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you so much. So, you know, I'm passionate about innovation and leadership. And one of the things that I like to do is, is help individuals to um, really fuel your career using those. And um, one of the things that I found when I was at Pfizer and working and I was getting really great feedback, um, I asked for more responsibility. I asked for more to do. And, and it wasn't a no, but it was, it was more of like a not yet. And I, and I waited and I said, well, what else do I have to do? They're like, no, you're doing great. Just keep doing what you're doing. I'm like, okay, that's great. But then nothing happened. So instead of going out and finding another job that would recognize my abilities, um, I decided to try something different. I, try, I decided to lead my own innovative project on the side, outside of my day-to-day. -day, um, I had the idea to create an innovation space at the time when everyone was in the same office where that was important, all we had was cubicle land. And I'm like, that does not help spur innovation or innovative thinking collaboration. Um, long story short, I was just you know, a doer at that point. I was not a manager. I was not a director. I had no power influence, but I was able to get my president stakeholder on board, $1.5 million to completely reconstruct half of an office floor into an innovation space. And the first year opened over 65 teams used it, which was so amazing. And it was after I did that, after people saw me outside of my role that I could do other things, they started to see me differently. And then I didn't have to ask for more anymore. People asked for me instead. And they took chances on me when I wanted to change to a completely different role, a completely different function, because they knew that I could adapt. They knew that I could have those leadership skills. And so that's what I want to share with you if you're interested in owning your career and really how do you build these leadership and innovation skills yourself by leading your own passion project. And so that's what I'm doing is um, not this next immediate week, but the week after May 3, 3rd through 5th, there's one hour of training each day to be able to go through, how do you go about doing that? And after you do that, you'll have a roadmap of the steps you'll have to take to be ready to go and start that the next day. So I wanted to share that with all of you, that there's a free resource to be able to get started. If anything we're talking about today really resonated with you, um, we can go even deeper. So um, there's gonna be a, a link right there in the chat. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, that's where you get registered. You have to reserve your seat. Um, there are limited seats, so make sure you do that. And uh, I hope to see you there. Thank you. Well, I think you're muted. 
Yeah, Ade, you, you're, yes. there you go. I'm back. Oh, thank, you so, <laughs> thank you so much, Laura. Uh, this is amazing. Um, and this is transformational uh, stuff here. Uh, so we really, really thank you for uh, bringing this to uh, the PM Roundtable audience and uh, sharing this amazing uh, opportunity. Uh, again, thanks once again. Uh, we'll get back to the conversation around innovation and leadership. Um, my question, I guess I'm gonna to go to you next, um, Amid. Um, in terms of a key takeaway, and we're looking at potentially wrapping up soon, um, what are some of the key takeaways? Uh, what, what would you want people on the call to leave this call with? I think uh, Laura said it best, and uh, I think it was typed in the, the chat as well. A key takeaway is limitation shouldn't spur innovation. Like literally, I wholeheartedly believe in that, you know, being able to adapt, create, and innovate in, in that limited capacity definitely spurns the best ideas. It's, it's tried, tested, and true. We've been, you know, in those situations before, and I, I truly believe that that's something everyone should be able to take away. All right. Thank you so much, Amit, and thank you so much for joining us today at the PM Roundtable. This is a huge, huge uh, uh I guess take away for folks to uh, go home with with this um, you know topic. Um, we'll go to you next, Laura. Um, key takeaways for participants to leave here with today. For me, a key takeaway is um, is you have everything you need. You can innovate. You can lead no matter where you are. If you're already innovating, you're already leading, awesome. You can also take it to the next level, right? Um, the only difference between the levels within an organization is the level or the scope of the problem you're solving gets bigger, right? There's a little bit more risk in the decisions that are being made, but the skills that you use are the same. So you can innovate right now, you can lead right now, don't wait, do it now, that's it. Okay, super, well, thank you so much, Laura, a uh, lot to unpack, I'm learning a lot, I'm learning a lot, uh, I, I'm looking at my notes here, I'm just looking at things to take away, um, uh, be a creative problem solver, you know, I'm looking at my notes, I'm looking at how do we shift from analytical thinking to creative thinking, um, you know, how do we start creating solutions for the future, uh, understanding the fundamentals of product uh, management and using that as a, as a framework to innovate. Um, you know, again, we talked about barriers, uh, having too many ideas, um, you know, uh, that may limit you in terms of how you execute innovative ideas. Um, Again, there's a lot to unpack here. I'm going through my notes. There's so much. Uh, I, again, I just want to thank uh, Laura and Amid for taking the time to join us today. This has been an insightful conversation. We'd love to hear more from you. We'd love to have you back. Um, again, thanking all the participants of today's roundtable. Uh, again, on behalf of, of the Oli Consulting team, I'd like to say a huge thank you. Uh, Oli Consulting, as you know, uh, we're a management consulting firm specializing in IT professional services in the areas of staffing, training, and project delivery services. And our mandate for this roundtable is to uh, create a unique platform for our PM and uh, IT professional community to network, share information, and create a space where uh, we can facilitate career growth. Ultimately, our goal is to raise leaders and we definitely hope that today's roundtable has helped help further that agenda um i would say follow us on instagram uh, to learn more about what we're doing follow us on instagram follow us on social media on linkedin on twitter i uh, would love to hear from you uh, and this session has been recorded. Uh, there will be a communication that we sent out to share the recording with everyone. Uh, we also have it live on Facebook. So folks, if you want to access this session, you can access on Facebook. Uh, again, once again, thanks so much, everyone, uh, for joining us for today's roundtable. Uh, until next time, stay safe, be well. Bye for now. Cheers, everyone. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Gennady. Everyone. Bye, guys. Bye.